Uh, it is a pleasure for me to represent Corwin in hosting uh, today's webinar on collective efficacy. I'm pleased to introduce you to our presenter, Jenny Donahue, who is an educational consultant and who many of you may know from her best-selling Corwin professional books. Dr. Jenny Donahue has been on assignment with the Council of Ontario Directors of Education for the past few years. Who is an um, in this role, she works with uh, system and school leaders to support high quality professional learning and um, improve adolescent literacy. As mentioned, she is the author of several core and best-selling books, including two books on collaborative inquiry, uh, one co-authored with Moses Velasco. Her most recently published book, Collective Efficacy, How Educators' Beliefs Impact Student Learning, illustrates the enormous power that teachers have to improve student learning and achievement when they work together. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jenny. Thanks, Charlene. Um, and welcome to everyone. For some of us, it's the morning, depending on where we're joining, from what part of the world. For some of us, it's afternoon, and some of us, it's already the evening. So I'm glad uh, that everybody could make it and join us this evening. And I'm going to ask, and I know Charlene and uh, Jeff will monitor that chat pod. And uh, again, if you have any questions, I'd, I'd also invite Charlene and Jeff to interrupt me um, because I know that I'll just get on a roll and I won't be monitoring that chat pod. Um, so at any point in time, if you think it's appropriate, Charlene or Jeff, please just uh, stop me and, and we'll go from there. Um, so collective teacher efficacy is our topic tonight. And it gained popularity and piqued the interest of many educators since topping John Hattie's list of factors that influence student achievement. And he made that announcement back in 2016. A few years ago, there was very little material on the topic readily accessible for educators. And although there were um, some empirical studies and, and actually many empirical studies dating back over 30 years, Resources that distilled the research into a usable and practical form of information for educators was really lacking. And so in an effort to fill that need, in 2017, I published Collective Efficacy, How Educators' Beliefs Impact Student Learning. And the purpose of that book was really to translate the existing literature on collective teacher efficacy into a form that was usable for practitioners and to provide some practical strategies tools and an inquiry framework to help really bridge the theory practice divide. Um, I really wanted to try to figure out how could we use this information in our practice. And more recently in the last couple of years, um, probably much like you do, um, you continue to learn and um, more information becomes available. And more recently, uh, Stephen Katz, who's the co-author with Lisa Dack of a book called Intentional Interruption, Breaking Down the Learning Barriers to Transform Professional Practice. Um, if you don't have that book, it's a must read. Um, but more recently, Stephen and I are collaborating on a follow-up book to Collective Efficacy. Um, in our follow-up book, we apply the concept of collective teacher efficacy to the problem of implementation in schools. And we argue that collective efficacy has, an, has the effect that it does, the, the high effect size, because it enables quality implementation. Um, we also argue that educators' beliefs affect thought patterns in ways that are either in service of quality implementation or in opposition to it. And during today's webinar, I'm going to share some of our latest thinking and research for the new book, as well as delve into ways, um, the ideas here around the enabling conditions that are outlined in the previous work. Um, as Charlene mentioned, I work in the field supporting adolescent literacy in schools and schools, school districts in the province of Ontario. Um, I often work with teacher teams while they collaboratively inquire into the challenges of their practice related to identified student learning needs. I also work with school and system leaders in support of high quality professional learning. So a lot of the writing and presenting that I do is based on my work and experiences that I have in the field, working with educators much like yourself every day. And I became really interested in understanding collective efficacy better, mostly based on some of my conversations with my colleagues. And what you have in front of you is a quote from a teacher from a high school in Ontario, Port Colborne Secondary School. Um, I was working in this school and, and interviewing teacher teams because they had made some significant gains on our provincial literacy test. 
uh, we saw consistent increases in success rate for students over the course of five years. And I think what this quote does is really captures the essence of collective efficacy. Um, it shows that the, the belief in what we do matters, that we can have an impact, and that student success can result from our actions. Um, and perhaps it might not have if we didn't try as teachers something different in our practice. And so I see some conversations in pockets in schools and in some districts that reflects this collective efficacy. Um, but I also see, um, unfortunately, um, a diminished sense of collective efficacy in the field as well. And this came from a teacher team, a teacher in particular at one of the high schools who was dealing with many pressures. And unfortunately, they reached the point where they felt this way, that there had been everything that they could do and there was nothing left to try. Um, and I, I wondered, you know, in having these conversations in the field, how do teams come to feel this way? How can we empower teachers so that they understand that they can and that they do make significant differences in the lives of students? And so I started to delve into the research and into my own experiences around the relationship between confidence and success. And the term collective efficacy was coined by Albert Bandura, who's a psychologist at Stanford University, who studied in the 1970s the relationship between confidence levels and success. And what he found was that um, uh, the more confident teams felt about their combined abilities, the more successful was their performance. And he defined collective efficacy as a group's shared belief in its conjoint capability to organize and execute courses of actions required to produce given levels of attainment. Um, the relationship between collective efficacy and better results has been established in research in multiple domains, including sports, business, and neighborhood crime. And today, um, as we proceed through today's webinar, I'm going to make an assumption that you've joined because the term collective efficacy is not new to you and that you've heard of Professor Hattie's visible uh, learning research and that you're aware that collective efficacy tops his list of factors that make a difference for student achievement. So those are some things we, we are not going to cover today. Um, some things that are important to understand, but again, I'm not going to go into depth in for today's webinar, are the sources of collective efficacy. And we know that collective efficacy is based on some past experiences, um, including mastery if our team has met with success in the past and saw some performance accomplishments be successful. We build our confidence that if we tried again, we'd be likely to achieve. Vicarious experiences when seeing other teams perform well, we build our confidence that together, um, perhaps we could give the, the same effort and, and produce the same results. Social persuasion is when we're convinced by a credible and trustworthy other that we constitute an effective team and affective states are emotional um, uh, reactions we have when we've succeeded or some negative feelings we have when we haven't. Um, we know through the research that these sources influence a team's interpretation of their effectiveness. But because our time together today is short, I wanna make sure that we consider some contextual variables, uh, the enabling conditions that strengthen collective efficacy in schools. These are the things that we have influence over, um, including things like school structures and the interactions that we can um, encourage between educators uh, school structures we know can be enabling or hindering. Enabling conditions include procedures for joint work and collaborative problem solving and collaborative inquiry. And hindering conditions are more where people are comfortable with the status quo, where the conditions are not conducive to learning, they're not conducive to progress, and people aren't willing to take risks and we don't have an environment of trust. We wanna make sure that we get to the conditions that allow for collaborative problem solving um, and increased positive interdependence amongst faculty. A culture where promoting collaboration is focused on instructional improvement. And so we're gonna talk about some of these enabling conditions today that come from the research. Um, and that's why really with the new book, uh, Stephen and I focus on the context, what leaders can do to foster collective efficacy in service of high quality 
implementation because we know that fostering collective efficacy in context is the key to achieving innovative and long lasting changes. Um, in the book, um, the first one, the collective efficacy, how educators beliefs impact student learning, I outline six enabling conditions that had been uncovered through my research and doing the, the work for the book. Um, and these conditions enable the realization of collective efficacy. We're going to focus on the first three today um, um, and not so much on the last three because of our time constraints. I just wanted to make sure we had time to really focus deeply on a few. Um, so I'll cover the first three in a few minutes, but just to give a brief overview of the, the three that we're not going to be talking about. Um, we know that through the research, when a staff um, is more cohesive, that they're more likely to also have a sense of efficacy. And cohesion refers to um, a shared philosophy of what constitutes sound um, pedagogy, instruction, and assessment. Um, responsiveness of leadership is another enabling condition, and that's when leaders are sure that they protect teachers from um, things that, I guess, divert their time and energy away from what matters the most, and that's a focus on student learning. Uh, responsiveness of leadership also ensures that teachers have the resources that they need to do their jobs well. And effective systems of intervention um, is around ensuring that we can identify those students who might be um, in risk or at risk and that we have systems in place to ensure that nobody falls through the cracks. So having said that we're going to focus on the first three enabling conditions, I've outlined uh, just three really broad learning intentions for you. Um, one is understanding why and how collective efficacy supports systemic change and improvement, but also how a lack of efficacy stifles change and how a lack of efficacy can, can stifle quality implementation. Um, the second one is around um, the contextual environmental conditions because these are the things that we can impact. We can help to enable conditions in schools in order to influence a team's interpretation of their effectiveness. So what are some of those things that we can impact? And um, finally, what are some actionable steps that we can take to put these things into place? And so the success criteria, and I will check in with you at the end of the session, is really around, um, I'm hoping you'll pay attention and, and look for three ways in which efficacy supports quality implementation of evidence-based practices. And I'm hoping by the end, you'll be able to consider some ways to advance teacher influence in your school. Um, we're gonna spend some time looking at goal setting, why it's important and how it relates to collective efficacy. And finally, um, name some ways for increasing teachers' knowledge of each other's work. I won't focus on this for, for very long, just this idea that collective efficacy has a high effect size, according to John Hattie's visible learning research and what matters most in raising student achievement. Um, again, I said at the beginning, I'm operating under the assumption that you're familiar with this. When I'm presenting, however, um, I get some questions sometimes from the audience where they're looking for a citation for that uh, particular effect size and, um, if you're interested recently um, with, along with Rachel Ells, who did the original meta-analysis as part of, part of her dissertation work, um, Rachel, John, and I recently published an article in Educational Leadership called The Power of Collective Efficacy. And it's a source for those of you that are looking to cite collective efficacy as the number one factor that influences student achievement. And we know that collective teacher efficacy is more than three times more powerful and predictive of student learning than things like socioeconomic status, home environment, parental involvement, student motivation, and collective teacher efficacy is also more than two times more powerful and predictive of student learning than things like feedback and prior achievement. It doesn't mean that those other things don't matter, but what it does mean is if we share the belief that we can impact student learning, it results in productive patterns of behavior on the parts of adults that make a difference for students. So just to define collective efficacy, um, it's the judgments of teachers that what they do matters, that they can have a positive effect on students. 
and their future oriented beliefs about our ability um, as a collective in specific situations or specific contexts. And realizing innovative and lasting changes that become accepted practices and produce positive outcomes is unlikely when efficacy is lacking because when teams are not efficacious, it affects behavior that stifles or undermines change. A faculty's belief that they cannot foster the conditions necessary to impact student learning is the most restrictive belief when it comes to achieving quality implementation in schools and in districts. However, when efficacy is firmly established, the shared sense of efficacy affects behaviors in ways that support change. And we define quality implementation as a process through which evidence-based promises of improvement-oriented interventions get realized in practice. And it's a reciprocal relationship where efficacy is strong, quality implementation includes spread, depth, sustainability, and shift in reform ownership. And so there is a reciprocal relationship between implementation, collective efficacy, and results. And the three ways in which beliefs affect behavior um, are here, and I'm going to just expand on each one of them briefly. Um, efficacy impacts how teams perceive constraints and opportunities afforded in unique school environments. It impacts motivational investments and efficacy beliefs become self-fulfilling prophecies. Collective efficacy impacts how teams perceive constraints and opportunities. Teams with low efficacy anticipate that their efforts aren't going to result in much and therefore they produce little change. While teams with a strong sense of efficacy figure out ways to exercise control even in environments that contain little opportunities and many constraints. And what Bandura says is that a be team's belief in their efficacy influences the anticipatory scenarios and futures that they visualize. Those who doubt their combined ability visualize failure scenarios that undermine implementation. And when a faculty lacks a sense of efficacy, they're less resourceful when faced with difficult challenges, teams slacken their efforts and settle for mediocre solutions. I'm going to share just uh, one of the research studies that demonstrated uh, that teachers can have an impact over and above socioeconomic status. In this particular study, it was schools that were serving economically disadvantaged students. And what the researchers found was teachers' beliefs directly predicted students' academic experiences in successful schools, regardless of student background characteristics. Um, in it took place in Texas, and there's a citation there for you, for those of you that are interested in reading more about it. But in Texas, like many other states and provinces, there are agencies that are responsible for public education. The Texas Education Agency rates school campuses based on student testing and accountability measures, and schools receive ratings from superior to substandard. In areas considered low, so so low socioeconomic status throughout this state, what they noticed was some schools were excelling while others were failing to meet the minimum standard based on these ratings. And these were the schools that were a um, topic for this particular investigation. Uh, what the schools had in common was that they all qualified as serving economically disadvantaged students and drawing on a random sample from schools who failed to meet the minimum standard and, and also schools who excelled in all areas for two consecutive years the researchers concluded, or conducted, sorry, group comparison research, and they were looking to see what was the relationship between collective teacher efficacy and student achievement. And what they found was that the collective efficacy from teachers in the superior campuses, um, the ones that had the superior rating over two years, regardless of socioeconomic status, um, that the teachers um, had much higher efficacy than the unacceptable campuses. And they found that uh, schools were able to impact student achievement because teachers believed in their own and their colleagues' ability to enhance student learning regardless of students' home environment, socioeconomic status, et cetera. Um, they noted that the resilience of the faculties and the shared vision for success of their students assisted them in overcoming the socioeconomic barriers that prevent so many other campuses 
from obtaining exemplary ratings. And, you know, in my work in the field, people sometimes doubt that collective teacher efficacy can impact student achievement over socioeconomic status. And Bandura was the first to generate interest in this area by demonstrating that the effect of perceived collective efficacy on student achievement was stronger than the link between socioeconomic status and student achievement. And consistent findings have been reported in a number of other studies since. And I wonder how many examples or research studies would it take to convince doubters that educators can make a difference. Um, one single example should be persuasive, and yet there are numerous studies that reach this conclusion. We know that collective teacher efficacy is more predictive of student achievement than socioeconomic status, and perhaps skeptics are not aware of the strength of the research. And as uh, Megan Shannon Moran put it, teachers in schools with high collective efficacy do not accept low student achievement as an inevitable byproduct of low socioeconomic status, lack of ability or family background. She said they roll up their sleeves and they get the job done. Um, when collective efficacy is reduced, we know that teams show significant reduction in the goals they set, and this impacts motivational investments. However, when collective efficacy is strengthened, it results in motivational investments. And I wanna just share briefly another um, study that I came across recently in my research. Um, this one was outside the field of education, but I think um, hopefully as I share well, what the study was about and what the researchers found, you'll see parallels to our work in education. Um, it was a study where the people that signed up didn't know what they were signing up for. They were led to believe they were um, enrolling in a competition um, in which they had to cycle on stationary bikes a distance of 2,000 kilometers in a team of three. They were told to believe that they were up against 100 other triads, and they were asked to set a time goal and a finishing place goal. And in between time trials, they were given bogus feedback. 13 groups were assigned to a high efficacy condition, and 13 triads were assigned to a low efficacy condition. And so in between, in between the time trials, they'd get on their cyclers and they'd, they'd you know, um, reach the 2000 kilometer mark. And in between um, time trials, they were told if they were in the high effic efficacy group that they were in the highest 5% of the triads. And if they were assigned to the low efficacy group, they were given the bogus feedback that they were in the lowest 20% and that their time exceeded those of the other triads. So what the um, researchers were interested in is what happened in between time trials. And they had predicted that those who received the bogus low efficacy feedback would lower their goals and lower their effort in between trials. And sure enough, that is what happened. Um, not only did they lower their um, goals that they thought that they could complete it in time-wise, but also their finishing place goals, but they started to slack in their effort and their time finishing time actually um, was less productive than it had been in their original start. So why is goal setting important? Um, goals direct attention to the task and away from distractions. Uh, they mobilize group efforts and they increase persistence. And when um, groups are you know, trying strategies that aren't working, Goals promote the development of new strategies because people want to reach their goal. They're motivated through this goal enhancing behavior. We also know that um, efficacy beliefs shape experience and that low expectations become self-fulfilling prophecies. If we don't believe we're capable, we don't try as hard. And why would we try when we don't believe we're going to succeed? However, if we have high expectations of ourselves or if others have high expectations of us, it results in a self-fulfilling prophecy as well, where our beliefs and our ability translate into better performance. 
So if we turn our attention now to the enabling conditions, we're going to focus on advancing teacher influence, goal consensus, and teachers' knowledge about one another's work as a way to enable collective efficacy in our context, in our schools, in our classrooms. And when we think about advancing teacher influence, it's um, really about shared decision-making on issues that are important to school improvement. Research shows that where teachers have the opportunity to influence important decisions, they also tend to have stronger beliefs in their conjoint ability of their faculty. However, simply inviting participation does not guarantee that teachers will feel empowered. Um, it's really dependent on their perception of the scope of their influence. And so as a structure or way to conceptualize teacher le leadership or teacher voice in school improvement, um, you'll notice in the book, I've offered um, this ladder of, of teacher voice and decision making. And the latter um, originally was conceived by Roger Hart um, for student voice in school decision making. And when I came across it a few years ago, um, my work is largely with adults and, and teacher learning. And so as I was looking at Roger Hart's ladder and thinking about how students could be involved, I was also thinking about how we might um, think about teacher involvement as well. So I want to give credit to, to him for conceptualizing this initially. Um, and you know, the idea is that there's degrees of non-participation, which include the bottom runs of the ladder that you'll see there. Uh, manipulation is when leaders use teachers to support causes by falsely claiming that those causes are inspired by staff or things like tokenism where teachers appear to be given a choice, but in fact have little or no choices about what they do or how they participate. And then if we work our way up the rungs of the ladder, we get to higher degrees of participation to the point where teachers are initiating, um, but shared decision-making with administrators, where projects and school-wide activities are initiated by teachers and decision-making is shared amongst formal and informal leaders, where teachers are designing and leading professional learning for school improvement strategies and where these projects empower teachers while at the same time allowing them to access and learn from the experiences of others. And sometimes when I share this, I share uh, just a couple stories around degrees of non-participation. Um, a friend of mine, and this is more of an administrator degree of non-participation, had been asked to sit on an interview team that would uh, determine um, who in the system would, that was applying for positions of added responsibility um, would be successful. So positions like vice principal or people moving from principal to, or sorry, vice principal to principal, or even people looking to move from classroom teacher to positions of added responsibility in the school district. And um, after a few times sitting on that committee, he stopped accepting. And I asked him, why aren't you um, no longer taking that opportunity? And he said that the decision had, was always made, that the superintendent always had somebody in mind. And if the committee um, had voted or uh, tried to make a case to promote somebody other than who the superintendent had decided, that the superintendent always made the final decision. So I think that's just a degree of, you know, a, a degree of manipulation or non-participation in relation to um, this ladder. And I think perhaps maybe you're thinking of times where um, you've been um, made to feel, you know, less of um, influence when it comes to decision making. And I think that the goal is really to work our way up this ladder so that we're empowering teachers um, to help make some decisions that are related to school improvement um, because they're really in the position to make change happen. Um, there's a quote, and I won't get it exactly right, by uh, Fullen and Hargraves, where, you know, teachers are in a position and we can't um, do change to them, but we can um, empower them um, at, as change agents because rather than doing it um, to them, it can only be done um, by and with them. And I really didn't get that right, but I think you get the idea. Um, so when we think about advancing teacher influence, what are some ways in which teacher participation in school decision making can in be increased where they have true decision making power? And what are some successes that you've experienced? And what are some challenges? 
And I'm going to just maybe pause for a few seconds um, for you to maybe there's some conversation happening in the chat pod. And I will just give you some time to think about that, those questions and maybe uh, contribute your thinking to the chat pods. Hi, Jenny. Uh, this is Charlene. Hi, Charlene. Hi. Um, while everybody is thinking about these questions, uh, we did receive a question um, asking about uh, the, the concept of collective efficacy. You, um, you mentioned that the research is not new, but it seems that collective efficacy is, um, is something that a lot of educators are talking about in recent years. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, why do you think it's, it's gained more popularity um, or more attention over the last few years? Sure. Um, a few years ago, when I heard Professor Hattie at a Corwin um, conference announce the update to his research, because he's um, constantly updating his research, and he talked about the notion of collective teacher efficacy, of course, I Googled it. And when you Googled collective efficacy about three years ago, you'd get the majority of hits that were related to neighborhood crime and a lot of the research on neighborhood crime and collective efficacy had been done out of Chicago um, by a lead researcher named Robert Sampson. And what he found was in neighborhoods where um, communities felt a sense in their ability to overcome crime, there was significantly less um, vandalism, less homicide, less crime. Um, he's repeated those studies in a number of places, including places like Stockholm, and found that the relationship is the same. The higher collective efficacy is in neighborhoods, the lower the crime rate. Um, and so a few years ago, when Professor Hattie started to talk about this, um, I couldn't find a lot of information. And now, it was just yesterday, I was interested in Googling it and checking out how many hits um, appear. And it's not like years ago, there was a lack of information. Um, it was information, however, that was really buried in professional journals. And sometimes access to those journals sit behind firewalls at universities, um, you know, people who perhaps are working on masters or dissertations or, um, you know, people who are, are doing some kind of a study might look into that. But the everyday busy person who's in schools, um, and we know what a day looks like for an average educator, um, typical people aren't going to 30 page dissertations or empirical studies to unpack this research. And so um, the notion is not new. And when we were collaborating to write uh, the paper for educational leadership, uh, that was one of the messages that um, John Hattie really wanted to get across. And so I think there's a line in there that he inserted that says, this is not a new concept. It has been around for more than 30 years. The research is dating back to the 1970s. So that's even more than 30 years ago. And um, I think that it's, even though people are, it might seem as a new concept because it's becoming or gaining interest. I don't want to say popularity, but interest. I think the interest is based on John Hattie's update. Um, and then, of course, the more people talk about it, the more people understand it and the more sense it just seems to make. Um, and so then that's why I think that it's um, now if we Google it, of course, you're going to find a lot of hits related to, to education. Um, more people are blogging about it. There's a great hashtag on Twitter, collective advocacy, lots of information being exchanged. And I think it's um, something that people are grasping um, because it's empowering knowing that teachers, and we know that the research shows that teachers can make a difference. Um, and that, that's not even new information. It's just, um, I think it's empowering and exciting to people. Was there another question that you want me to, to address right now, Charlene, or should I continue on? Um, no, we can continue on, but I do want to point out for everybody on the webinar that um, we have some great contributions from attendees about uh, in, in response to Jenny's questions in the last slide. So do please check out the webinar chat 
Yeah. Excellent. And I can't do that right now, but I'll definitely go back and um, I'll check that out as well. So um, the other enabling condition is really around goal setting. And in my experience in working in schools and working with teacher teams, I don't think we know enough about goal setting and I don't think we do it justice. I know in the past we'd, you know, and we still do require that schools have school improvement plans and they set goals, but we don't provide enough support um, or information about how goal setting works. So this is an important concept that I think we need to delve deeper into. And one of the places we can go is um, Vivian Robinson's best evidence synthesis um, around school leadership and student outcomes where she and her colleagues identify what works and why. And some of you might be familiar with this research. It was a meta-analysis that looked at leadership practices that make a difference for student achievement. And she identified five. And goal setting was um, the second highest in, in a tied place with another one of her leadership practices, um, but with an effect size of 0 0.42. And this idea of goals, um, they create common tasks and processes for groups or individuals. And by having goals, a group knows what it has to do and can work together on the goals. Um, Vivian Robinson's research shows and tells us that with greater clarity than ever before, school leaders are more effective when they are at the center of teaching and learning in their school and engaged as pedagogical leaders. School leaders are most effective when they set clear pedagogical goals, when they develop staff consensus around those goals, and when they provide the tools for teachers to achieve the goals, and when they immerse themselves, of course, as leaders in the professional development associated with reaching those goals. Um, there's evidence that the content of goals may be as important as the process of goal setting, and leaders need to know um, what goals to set as well as how to set them. And this graphic is um, also in my book with permission from um, the original authors. Um, and it just is really meant to try to unpack how goal setting works. And goal setting requires an appropriate level of difficulty to be established. If goals are seen as too difficult or too easy, they will not be motivating. Um, the perceived difficulty of a goal and the perceived capacity to meet it are inseparably linked. Um, so what counts as difficult will change as capacity changes, because as we um, build our capacity to meet the goals, then we can set higher goals. And goals are motivating if three conditions uh, listed here in the figure on the screen are met. Um, number one, teachers, parents, or students must feel they have the capacity to meet the goals. Either they believe their current resources are sufficient for the purpose, or they are confident they will be given additional expertise and support where needed. Number two, people are committed to the goals. And this first requires that um, they all understand and value the goals. And as long as this is the case, it doesn't matter whether they particip participate sorry, in the actual goal setting process. Research on teacher professional development does, however, draw attention to the effectiveness of goals that are co-constructed and that are based on a joint analysis of problems. Um, and that's probably because the shared process enhances teachers' understanding of what it will take to achieve the goals and at the same time builds their capacity and confidence. And finally, goals are specific and unambiguous. Um, the specificity makes it possible to assess progress and adjust a team's practice accordingly. And so again, goal setting for both teachers and students is part of a cycle of evidence-based assessment analysis and determination of next steps. Um, when we talk about link to a compelling moral purpose, that is around student achievement and identif identified student learning needs. Um, they need to include a target and a time frame. And in Vivian's research, it was a feature of successful projects that leaders checked rather than assumed teachers' capacity to a set, a set appropriate goals and where needed provided opportunities for teachers to learn how to link student data to next teaching steps. Um, I'm just gonna share a quick story um, in uh, researching for the next book. 
I had the pleasure, um, Stephen and I interviewed uh, Stacy Allison, who's the first uh, American woman to make it to the top of Mount Everest. Um, and she talked to us about the idea that it was um, definitely a team effort and something that could not be accomplished um, alone. She credits the team and collective efficacy for the success of making it to the top. Um, in their first attempt, they made it to 25,000 feet. The, the mountain, the top of the mountain is 29,000. It's, it's the highest mountain on the face of the earth. And in their first attempt, when they made it to the 25,000 foot mark, uh, the worst storm to hit the mountain in 40 years um, caught up with them. And as a result, they were in a snow cave for five days. And she said they had to keep digging uh, a hole out every 15 minutes just so that they could get enough oxygen. Um, they had to turn back because their health was deteriorating and the environmental conditions were too much for them to, to make it up. Um, but they didn't stop that from allowing them to try again. Uh, they really had this sense of efficacy where they felt that together um, they were committed and they were going to succeed. And after 29 days of the mountain, they made it to the top in their second attempt. And the story really, I think, helps to illustrate um, Bandura's explanation about how efficacy beliefs come to fruition. Um, really, efficacy beliefs operate in teams by influencing the types of futures teams seek to achieve how well they use their resources, how much effort they put into their group endeavor, and their staying power when their collective efforts fail to produce quick results or when they meet with opposition. Um, it also affects their vulnerability to discouragement. So we can only imagine the numerous obstacles that Stacey Allison and her team faced during the journey to the top and their resilience, their commitment and effort and how much must have been necessary in order for them to succeed. Um, they needed to ensure the best use of their resources because their lives depended on it. And even though she didn't succeed in her first attempt, she did not let that discourage her from trying again. again. Um, they had confidence in each other and believed that together they could conquer Everest and did not let vulnerability deter, deter them or turn them around when faced with extreme challenges. And so Stacy talked to us about the role that goal setting played in motivating her team. She said that as climbers, when the team had grew uh, tired or faced difficulty, they could look up and be reminded of their goal. Um, when looking up at the peak, she said they realized that that's where they wanted to be and the team therefore was motivated to continue. Now, she also pointed out that the beauty of climbing a mountain is that you can actually see your goal. And she noticed, noted to us the importance of educators visualizing goals that aren't right there in front of them. We know that challenging goals raise motivation for success and motivation for success creates opportunities in which innovative and lasting changes can be realized. So I'll pause again for just a minute to just pose the question, how is your goal setting process related to Robinson's conception of how goal setting works? And what might you do to strengthen goal setting in your school? Um, I'd encourage some, um, again, uh, participation in the chat pods uh, to think about this. As I started on the goal setting piece, um, I shared that school improvement, you know, we require people to set goals, but not provide a lot of support around that. Um, and I, I think it's an area definitely where we can delve deeper into because it's um, very closely related with collective efficacy. And so I'll just pause there for a second. And one other point around the goal setting is the importance of celebrating small wins. And I like this quote because it speaks to collective efficacy and our ability to foster it. Um, when teams experience small wins, um, it helps to fuel transformative bigger changes by leveraging tiny advantages into patterns that convince people that bigger achievements are within reach. 
And I think of Stacy Allison and that there were base camps along the way. They weren't, you know, um, reaching the summit, of course, in, in a small amount of time. It took them almost a month, um, but that each time they reached a base camp, um, they could smell, celebrate that small win. So what are the small wins in schools that um, we can celebrate? And the third enabling condition that we're going to look at tonight is the idea of um, teachers' knowledge about one another's work and increasing teachers' knowledge about each other's work. And that really speaks to me of the idea of structuring opportunities for teachers to engage in what Judith Warren Little would call joint work. Um, Judith Warren Little in the 1990s, and if you haven't read this article, it's one, even though it was written in 1990, which seems maybe like a long time ago, it's so relevant still to us today. Um, she created a taxonomy for examining strong and weak ties amongst teachers. And she describes joint work as positive interdependence where teachers are engaged in um, collaboratively um, examining problems where they're opening up their practice. And I think she uses the phrase, opening up it up to scrutiny in search of a better way. Uh, joint work is characterized by um, not only positive interdependence, but it's that idea that our success, my individual success, depends on the team. Um, we know that research shows um, that leaders don't have a direct influence on student achievement. But in this recent study that looked at um, leadership's indirect impact on student achievement, it showed that when leaders set the conditions in their buildings for collaboration, and that's collaboration amongst teachers that's focused on instructional improvement, that collaboration, that joint work, uh, the deliberating over recurring problems in our profession leads to increased collective teacher efficacy and collective teacher efficacy in this study uh, resulted in increases in student achievement. So the idea is that leaders need to set the conditions for effective collaboration that is reflective of what Judith Warren Little would refer to as joint work. Um, recently I came across this meta-analysis that showed the relationship between collective efficacy and performance is maximized when there's positive interdependence amongst team members. And so again, um, when we think about joint work, it's those encounters amongst teachers that rest on shared responsibility for the work of teaching. But with jo Judith Warren Little said in 1990, those felt interdependencies in teaching are few. And I would argue that today we could say the same thing that the felt interdependencies in teaching are few. And it's got me thinking, how can we increase interdependence? And so in um, thinking more about this, there are three types of interdependence. Um, task interdependence, goal interdependence, and outcome interdependence. And the three influence conjointly the degree to which members must work together to perform effectively. And some team tasks require very little interdependence, while others require a high degree. So when you're thinking about task interdependence, what are some ways you can increase um, the degree of interdependence that's required amongst the tasks, tasks that are being um, required of teaching and or learning? Um, goal interdependence. While team goals help to facilitate the development of cooperative strategies, individual goals are likely to encourage strategies that maximize individual performance. So again, this is where goal setting comes into place. And what are the, the goals? Are they implied as individual or team goals? And finally, the third type of interdependence, outcome interdependence, refers to the existence of consequences and rewards that are shared by team members in sorry, contingent on individual or collective performance. And so what are some ways that we can increase interdependence, um, task, goal, and outcome interdependence? What are some structures to increase teachers' knowledge about each other's work? Uh, what are some protocols? 
Um, and perhaps there's lots that you've experienced and I'd encourage you to share some of these in the chat pod. And I could have listed uh, more here, but we don't have a lot of time to get deeply into some of these. Um, but I love um, the idea of a consultancy protocol. Um, you can Google it and find it online through the National School Reform Faculty. It's a protocol that's structured and timed where a team comes together and um, a teacher is in a safe place because the protocol builds in that safety to identify a recurring problem that he or she might have in their practice. And uh, the team uh, then gives advice in the form of consultants um, without being judgmental. Um, I've used it many times in the field and because people are both sharing some of their struggles but also um, getting practical advice about their work, um, it's really been a successful protocol to build efficacy and to increase teachers' knowledge about one another's work. Uh, lesson study is another um, great structure where teachers come together, share their expertise, their knowledge, try something to practice, come back to discuss how it worked, did it work. Um, and the same with collaborative inquiry. That's where my early work and my, my work still in the field um, lies, where um, really helping to facilitate an inquiry process where teams are identifying student learning needs, trying something new in their practice um, based on information, research, expertise from the group, um, looking at student evidence to see if it made a difference, um, and then figuring out if it didn't, why, and if it did, what do others need to know, um, and then determining what's their next best practice to put in place, all based on um, the identification of student learning needs and assessing the impact we're having as a team on student learning. Um, my other two books, um, were around how to facilitate collaborative inquiry. And then the second one, the follow-up was a look at um, systemic factors where collaborative inquiry was taking hold in districts and where in some places it wasn't meeting its potential. And so kind of a look at that. Um, but I really believe in this cycle of inquiry because um, to me, it's the epitome of joint work. It engages people um, in that level of analysis um, where they realize um, through evidence and through their collaboration that they're making a difference and it's efficacy enhancing in that way. And I just wanna share, um, this is one of my second last slides before turning it back over to uh, Charlene, um, working recently with a beginning teacher and her, her teacher team, it was um, a group of math teachers and they were um, primary math teachers, so teaching grade. Uh, kindergarten, grade one, grade two. And at the end of the year, we came together to talk about how the collaboration was going. And they had engaged in um, collective, or sorry, collaborative inquiry. And I just want to show that through that process, they really built some uh, collective efficacy. The one beginning teacher said, um, our common planning time and then our observations made me feel more confident in challenging my students. At the beginning of the year, when you all shared that you, what you had your students doing, in my head, I thought, my kids can't do that. But through our work together, I've seen otherwise. So through their work, she has um, really changed her expectations of what her students are able to do. She's moved from low expectations to high expectations. She's taken risks, and she's made it work in her classroom. And that was because of her collaboration with her colleagues. And then later in the meeting, she said that at the beginning, she really felt that she didn't have a lot to contribute when they were planning their lessons, but she now feels a certain sense of confidence. She has a role that she can come in and contribute rather than just sit back and listen. And to me, this is where our work resides. Um, there's no uh, magic bullet, clear cut way. Um, we know through the research that there are certain enabling conditions and leadership practices um, and sources that influence a team's interpretation of their effectiveness. Um, but this work really unfolds day to day in your buildings um, as you're trying to figure it out. Um, you know, like some of these things we could continue to uh, go down this wormhole. Well, how do you do that? And how do you do that? And, and I think that that's the work to figure out moving forward. How can we continue to increase opportunities and structures for joint work? 
um, how can we make goal setting effective in a way that teams realize their impact and realize their goals and as a result build their efficacy and um, how can we um, move forward with um, advancing teacher influence in schools in ways that teachers feel um, honored and empowered. And so um, having said that, we're very close to the, the hour. Um, the success criteria, and again, I know that there was a lot jam-packed in here, um, and I hope that um, you're walking away with some some strategies, um, ways that collective efficacy supports quality implementation, um, thinking about advancing teacher influence in your school. Perhaps you'll want to go back to that ladder and kind of do a self-assessment where, where are there opportunities to um, involve teachers in decision making and matters that, that are um, relevant for school improvement, um, delving into goal setting and um, putting structures like collaborative and Korean lesson study into place. Um, for a comprehensive review of research, this is what I do on my weekends. I spend my time. My husband um, spends our, his weekends renovating our 200-year-old home, and I spend my Saturdays and Sundays combing through the research. And recently, um, I've just uh, published two um, reviews, one that looks at positive consequences of teacher efficacy, and another that looks at the implications for professional learning. What do we know about professional learning that enhances collective teacher efficacy? So I just wanted to draw your attention to those as well if you're interested in delving more into this topic and welcome you to communicate with me through email. Um, I'd love to just continue the conversation. And there's my email address. If anybody would like to reach out, again, please feel free. I'd be happy to continue. And for those of you that um, posted some questions in the chat pod or whatever that dialogue was, my intention is to uh, catch up with it and uh, definitely um, get back to you. So I'll turn it back over to Charmaine. All right, thank you very much, Jenny. And um, we did receive some questions from uh, from attendees, but I believe we are just about out of time. And so we can, uh, we will get to your answers uh, via email. And you can also um, post uh, some of the, some of your responses and answers um, to the Corin Connect blog. So do be on the lookout for that. We will uh, send that to you via email uh, by the end of the week, along with the slides and a link to the, this recorded webinar for your review. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us to, uh, this evening or this morning, depending on where you are again. Um, for more information about Jenny's um, resources and books, um, please check out her most uh, recently published book on collective efficacy. As a special discount, for, and thank you for attending today's webinar. Um, we have a 20% off uh, discount code available there on, on the screen. And we'll also send you the webinar um, discount code via email uh, by the end of the week. Um, you can get this di discount uh, through the end of June at corin.com. You can also learn more about Jenny's um, books on collaborative inquiry as a structure uh, for supporting collective efficacy in schools. Um, the book on her on the left is for principals and other instructional leaders um, about the conditions that support uh, and help uh, help make collaborative inquiry successful for teams. And the resource on the right is for uh, teachers and facilitators who are participating and uh, leading those teams. And once again, if you'd like to go in depth into how to foster collective uh, teacher efficacy and put some of the research and concepts you heard presented today uh, in, into practice, you can uh, work with Jenny, uh, invite her to your school or district to work uh, directly with your team to, um, to, to implement these practices. That brings us to the end of today's webinar. Uh, please join us in two weeks. Our next webinar is on June 4th. Uh, at the same time, uh, the topic is Grading for Impact, Raising Student Achievement Through a Target-Based Assessment and Learning System. Uh, you can register for this free webinar at www.corin.com forward slash webinars. 
Once again, uh, thank you very much to Dr. Jenny Donahue for uh, presenting today's webinar on collective efficacy. Uh, thank you, and I wish everybody a good day or a good evening. <laughs>